Japan Cultural Exploration in Guam. Okay, well, Frank, thank you for inviting us to your home. Um, I'm wondering if you can help us out and provide a brief introduction of yourself, please. Okay, half a day. Uh, my name is Frank San Nicolas Shimizu. I am a sensei, that is a third generation Japanese. Uh, I am uh, a great grandfather, a grandfather. Uh, I do run a business and a chairman of the Guam Nikkei Association. Also, I am the grandson of Jose Katsuzi Ogawa Shimizu, my grandfather who was one of the original Japanese Isais or settlers here in Guam. Tell us a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about my grandfather. He was born in 1873 and passed away in 1944. He's from, uh, originally from Koga City in the prefecture of Ibaraki. Uh, he's, uh, when he came to Guam, he, when he came to Guam, he wanted to get married, but in order for you to get married, you gotta uh, obey the Spanish laws. And the Spanish law says you cannot marry a, a local Zamoro Spanish uh, lady unless you're uh, baptized and adopt the uh, Catholic religion. So his baptismal name, his Spanish name, his Christian name is Jose Maria Katsuji Ogawa Shimizu, it's a long one. Hmm. Um, he is known by his uh, younger generation and younger relatives as Tata Katsa. Now Tata in Samoa means father. If you're in Hawaii, you call everybody that's older than you uncle. If you're related to a certain older man, uh, and you want to address him, you call him Tata. In this case, his nickname is Katsa, so we call him Tata and Katsa. To his business uh, uh, friends and uh, peers, he's just known as JKS, Jose Katsuzi Simizu. In talking about my grandfather uh, and his life events, <coughs> in, uh, as a 19-year-old in uh, in uh, Koga City, he left for Tokyo, the big city. Uh, at that time, Japan is not, not uh, it's, it's, in hurt, it's hurting economically, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like a depression. So jobs are very scarce. So he goes from the small town of Koga to the big city of Tokyo, hoping to land a job. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he was lucky because he, he worked for a pharmaceutical uh, wholesale medicine company, and he worked there for a few years. Still, he's looking for a better, better opportunity, better job. So he took on a, uh, a uh, you know, the sense of adventure. He went overseas, accepted a job as a branch manager for Nanyo Hiki Trading Company in Saipan. There in Saipan, he married a local Zamora lady by the name of Magdalena Ariola. had two sons. First son was born in 1899. His name is Jose, but everybody calls him Itzang. The second son, born in 1901, was named Antonio. After marrying, marrying a local Jap uh, Zamora lady, he uh, started leasing land in Saipan and even outside of Saipan. Agrigan, Pagan, and so forth. Um, started planting coconuts and, and started his coconut plantation to make copra. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Then a few years later, in 1902, a tragic event, two tragic events happened. Uh, he was 29 years old only when his Saipan wife, Magdalena, died. And at the same time, same year, uh, Saipan was hit by a, by a big typhoon. And in, in 1902, 
the typhoon destroyed most of his plantation. So he said, that's it, he relocated to Guam. Shortly thereafter, about 1903, uh, as a 30-year-old, he fell in love again, this time with a Samoro Spanish lady. Her name is Magdalena, or excuse me, Concepcion Martinez Torres. He had four children, a daughter, Carmen, uh, three sons, uh, Jesus or Jim, Joaquin or Jack, and my dad, Ambrosio. In 1909, the wife, Concepcion Torres Simiso, uh, died. And uh, my dad was only a few hours old when the mom died of childbirth. Uh, she lost a lot of blood in the uh, premature uh, birthing of uh, my dad, and she died. <clears throat> uh, however, the infant Ambrosio was adopted by a close family friend, the Leon Guerrero family, the so-called Paquito family. Uh, the mom there was also nursing a baby girl. So we call her Mariana, Nana and Mariana. Nana is the same thing as Tata, except Nana is mother, Nana and Mariana. So Nana Mariana took, took my dad and nursed him back to health. And uh, my dad was so uh, uh, grateful to that family. He stayed with them until he got married, even though he was running, managing his father's store. Some of the business adventures of my grandfather, uh, Jose Katsuji Ogawa Simiso, has five different kinds of businesses. Uh, first off, he opened a store. Then he started importing uh, products from Japan, so he started an import business. Uh, he imported rice, canned goods, construction materials, beer such as Kirin, <laughs> Uh, in 1909, that uh, uh, the first Kirin shipment was came came to Guam. Mm -hmm. That's important. Another business area that he's involved in is export. His plantations here in Guam uh, produce copra and sugar, so he used that those products, put in aboard his uh, ship and exported it to Japan. Because of this import and export business, he got involved in the shipping industry. So he bought three that I know of, three vessels to go from Guam to Japan, Japan back to Guam via Saipan. And at the same time, being a, a local a citizen already, having married a, a local uh, lady, um, he can now lease land, he can rent land, and I believe he can even purchase land. So he started purchasing and leasing land in the northern part of Guam, near Dedido, the southern part of Guam, near Agat, and of course down right here in Tokza, which is uh, near between Talavofo and Zolnia. And of course his, his other business venture is retail. He owned a, uh, operated and owned a uh, general merchandise retail store. What was the name of that store? The name of the store is just simply JKS Store. JKS Store, very good. So uh, there's a little history that suggests that your grandfather went to Japan and he actually tried to recruit workers from Japan to Guam, which became actually the original <coughs> group of uh, pioneers that stayed, that's, many stayed in the generation. That's correct. <coughs> uh, don't forget, I, I just remember that I, uh, said that Japan during those times uh, hard, had uh, some hardships mm -hmm. and jobs were scarce. So when he started his uh, plantation here, he started his business here, uh, <clears throat> he had no problem recruiting his countrymen, whether they be from Ibaraka Prefecture or elsewhere. Uh, they, were, they gladly came to Guam because there were no jobs back then, and he recruited many, uh, many uh, Japanese Issei 
uh, I don't recall too many of them other than uh, Sayama is one of them, mm. and I believe Shinohara is another one. Mm. This is a photo of one of his uh, motor schooner, the Mariana Maru. Uh, I myself used to own a, a small sailboat, so I really like that, the, that photo. Uh, he used it to ship copra and sugar back to Japan, ship uh, uh, produce such as canned goods, mm. beer and so forth, back to Guam. He also transported passengers between Guam and Saipan, and occasionally from Guam to Japan. This is a picture of what used to be before, <coughs> before the war, his copra plantation. It is now a golf course, and it's called Country Club of the Pacific. This photo is, uh, is a picture of his store. The first floor of that building um, occupies the entire store. Up above, don't forget that uh, at those times, Guam is a territory of the United States. And the U.S. Uh, servicemen and civilians uh, had a club called the Elks Club, and it was uh, located in the second floor of, uh, of the JKS store. Where was the store situated on Guam? Where was the store situated on Guam? Pardon me? So, oh, so the location? Yes. The location of the JKS store is uh, right near the post office, where the Ganya post office is, across from the plaza. Okay. Then, of course, in 1941 and 1944, uh, World War II came. So a couple of years before 1941, uh, the JKS operation stopped because of the war. Uh, two, two parts of the war, part one of course is December 8, the first battle of Guam and the Japanese occupation. The second part of the war is July 21, 1944. That's when the United States forces came and re took, recaptured Guam. This is the photo I showed you earlier of uh, the JKS store before the war. And on the right side is the JKS store after the war. Nothing left, Total, totally destroyed. And <clears throat> uh, this is the last photograph of my grandfather taken when he was 71 years old. Uh, it's around 1944, shortly before he disappeared. Okay, now, we're going to talk a little bit about my dad, Ambrosio Torres Simizo. He was born in 1909 and passed away in 1988. He is the youngest son of Jose Katsuzi Ogawa Simizo and Concepcion Martinez Torres. He's known, uh, he's known as Ambrosian Katsa. Katsa, of course, is the nickname of the clan, the Simizo clan, and uh, his, his first name is Ambrosio. The, in, in, in Guam, the uh, nickname for Ambrosio is Bozzo. So to his friends and peers, he's Bozzo. And to his business associates, he's just known as ATS. He had four children. Uh, I'm the oldest. Uh, my sister is the second oldest. My sister's name is named after my grandmother, Concepcion. She is married to an Australian and I've been living in Australia for over 30 years. Uh, then I have a, a brother by the name of Joe, Joseph, and uh, my youngest brother, Paul. In 1972, uh, ATS retired from his business activity and uh, myself and Joe took over the business. So after World War II, my dad um, started Ambrose Incorporated. And in 1948, it, it was operating unofficially, um, uh, selling surplus military goods, such as vehicles, jeeps, and uh, weapons carrier uh, parts. And uh, uh, understand even um, 
surplus beverages. But in 1949, in August, uh, the three partners, Brochu, Van Smith, and Vicente Palomo, uh, legally and officially incorporated into Ambrose Inc. Uh, with articles of incorporation and bylaws. <clears throat> At that time, after the war, Ambrose Inc. His main, main business is uh, selling malt beverages. And they secured the <coughs> exclusive distribution rights for Anisha Bush products, namely Budweiser. So that company has been distributing Budweiser since 1949, <coughs> so it's a lot of years. But <coughs> it, um, it expanded into selling tobacco products uh, one of the uh, main products at that time was cool cigarettes uh, manufactured by Brown and Williams from tobacco. It uh, expanded into spirits such as whiskey, scots, cognac, wine. Uh, and then shortly thereafter in uh, the next page, it um, expanded and starting in about 1993, uh, expanded into other products, consumer products such as Kimberly Clark. They make Kleenex, they make uh, uh, feminine products such as Kotex, and they make uh, paper towels. They also started uh, distributing Mead Johnson products, that's your Enfamil baby formula. Uh, and a notable product that uh, we added was Etoen teas. Etoen, uh, we, we were lucky to get the exclusive distribution rights in 1998. And fortunately, Etoen company also owns Aloha Made Juices in Hawaii and Aloha Vai bottled water. This picture, but when, when my dad retired, uh, Joe and I took over in 1972, and my brother, my youngest brother Paul, came in about 10 years later. We started thinking about expanding in other areas, in other uh, locations. So the first expansion was in 1974. We opened a branch in Saipan uh, called Mariana Pacific Distributors. In 1990, we opened a small branch in Palau and it's still in operation. And uh, about eight years ago, we opened our third branch in American Samoa. And it's called South Pacific Distributors or SOPAC. Those are the three uh, uh, facilities picture there. So in uh, 2014, we, our new facility, our new warehouse, our new offices uh, was completed and we moved into there. Uh, the designer for that facility is Andy Laguania. Andy also designed the Guam Museum. And he also designed the Issei Memorial uh, Monument in uh, Jigu Peace Park. Um, and it's also noteworthy that Andy's wife is a Yonsai, fifth generation uh, descendant of Jose Katsuzi Ogawa Shimizu. And the builder of that warehouse, incidentally, is Sumitomo Mitsui Construction Company. Uh, they did a very good job. We're grateful. Uh, it's all concrete. And the, the Sumitomo built it so that it can withstand typhoons of up to 200 miles an hour. Fortunately, we don't have, we've not had any occasion to test it yet. <laughs> so if you count the time that JKS, Katsuji Shimizu, started his business to now, we will have been in business for 112 plus years. 
so Frank, I want to ask a little bit about you and your contribution to Guam and um, you know, if you can provide some words of wisdom uh, to our younger generation and to the rest of the island. Uh, I was curious to know, is there an ideology or a statement or a belief that was passed down uh, from you know, your grandfather down to the generations that are now with you? Okay, to so your, your... The very first question about... Um, legacy and shared wisdom? Yes, your shared wisdom okay. and ideology that's continued to be <clears throat> upheld. Okay, as far as my grandfather is concerned, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it's unfortunate, but I did not get to know my grandfather uh, well. Um, I was only five years old when he passed away, when he disappeared. <clears throat> but my father, Ambrosio Torres Simiso, uh, is my primary uh, teacher and mentor. <clears throat> he showed me by example how to succeed in, uh, in business as well as raising a family. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he instilled in me and my brother Joe uh, that <clears throat> a family-owned business must be treated as a business and not treated as a family operation. Uh, most family operation, if it's treated that way, they soon have problems. But if it's treated strictly as a business, you have a chance to succeed. So <clears throat> what do I mean by that? He instilled in me, my dad, that we got to be strict, we got to be thrifty, and we got to be economical. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you have to be selective in giving credit, and uh, <clears throat> it's very important that you control your receivables, and the most important is to collect them make sure that they're collected. <clears throat> uh, my dad <clears throat> uh, used to harp and keep repeating, collection is just as important as sales, if not more so. <clears throat> and uh, he taught me things like pay for performance. You, you not only pay for, for the work that they do, but if they do well, reward them. <clears throat> and it's called pay for performance. There's a saying in Samoa that says, Nagoha para gupa, then para tempo In other words, set aside something for tomorrow, for hard and needy times, for hard times. Munga ma dispedition tomorrow means do not waste. And there are other things that he taught me, too numerous to mention, but these are just an example. Fantastic, thank you. Um, all right, I guess during your career, what have been the biggest challenges that you have faced while starting and continuing a business? Um, <clears throat> for me, initially, it, uh, it was my lack of experience in business, in the business world. Um, my college is mathematics, my college major is mathematics, and I minored in military science and psychology. Oh. Nowhere does that include business. Uh, so <clears throat> I had to learn as rapidly as I can. I mean, like, how do you write a business letter? I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can write. Uh, English pretty well, but how do you express yourself and what are the rules for writing a business letter? As an example, uh, <clears throat> we had to learn very rap rapidly. We call that learning on the fly, um, managing people, uh, conducting operations, business operations, satisfying customers, uh, dealing with uh, manufacturers, dealing with uh, uh, people that, dealing with the breweries, for example, <clears throat> and so forth. All that means is that in the beginning, my first 10 or 15 years with the company, you had to put in like 
at least 10 hours a day, six days a week, just to allow me the, the opportunity to learn the business. In the meantime, my brother Joe, who is a, who's a uh, uh, fin uh, finance corps uh, uh, non-commissioned officer in the Army, <clears throat> he also had to learn uh, and is busy learning about finances, accounting, inventory control, warehousing, and delivery. So he too was learning on the fly. And that was my biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, you overcame that challenge pretty well. It took a hard work. It took a long time. <laughs> it took a hard work. And I think that's really the essence of. I mean, my business. my family and my wife is, is is wondering what the heck is going on. You know, before my job was Monday to Friday, eight to five, and I'm home. I'm home for the weekend. But here, I'm only home pretty much on Sundays. Hard work paid off. I got a great business going. Um, okay, so the next question I want to ask was actually related to you being a sunset. Um, so, you know, do you think you've had any experiences or any challenges, either professional, professional or personal, um, being a Nikkei that you receive on the island? Has that made any impact on you? Uh, you mean the uh, secret to success? Um, no, so the next question is, um, well, we can talk about that too if you'd like. Um, <coughs> well, just going down there, okay. Okay. Uh, sure. the, in, in the order that you uh, you, wrote, right you have. Okay. No problem. <coughs> well, okay. So well, what, what do you believe is actually the secret to your success? Okay. Well, before that, you, you mentioned, you asked me, uh, what are the challenges being a Nikkei? Yes. yes. Have you had any, have you experienced uh, any challenges or hardships? Yeah, that's a good question. My, I, I guess my challenge is... Uh, getting the next generation, for example, my grandchildren, uh, interested in and wanting to be active members and participants of the Guam Nikkei Association. Mm. That's, that's a, to me, that's the biggest challenge. We are busy, mm. they are busy trying to raise a family, trying to, to work for a living, try to make a living, and for them to become active with the Nikkei Association, it's a challenge, and I'm going to, I'm working on it. Um, as far as secrets to success, um, the old saying, nothing beats working hard. Like I said, I was working 10 hours a day or more, six days a week. <coughs> and <clears throat> not only working hard, but in-person management. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you got to be active in the business. You got to oversee. You got to be there every day. Um, <clears throat> in the mid 1980s, I recall Anisha Bush asking me this similar question: Are there any Ambrose Inc. owners that are not actively working in the company? And I answered them, no. Every one, of, uh, every one of the Shimizu's who are active in the company are working in the company, not, not uh, outside of the company. <coughs> and it turns out that Anisha Bush is also, you know, the makers of uh, Budweiser, they're also a family-owned business. And they don't like to have relatives, friends working for the company or under the company's payroll and not being part of the company. Um, so working hard and make sure that you're actively uh, managing and uh, operating the company is, I think, uh, one of the uh, secrets to success. The other secret that I already mentioned is that following my dad's uh, example pay for performance, be thrifty, be economical, be very selective in giving credit, et cetera. Just basic business practice, which he didn't, he didn't go to school to learn that. He learned it naturally. On the job. Makes great sense. Then uh, Guam's challenges, yes. the next one. Um, 
Um, yes. Um, okay, so, so do you feel that Guam has any current challenges or room for improvement? If so, what would you suggest being a possible solution? Yeah, I have, I have just one comment on that, and I, I may get into trouble for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Guam's challenge, to me, there should be a, a better balance between the public sector, that's government, and the private sector, that's business. Uh, <clears throat> most of the island's revenue, unfortunately, is spent on expanding and adding departments and their workforce, leaving very little for improving, repairing, upgrading, maintaining of resources and infrastructure. We depend on the federal government to, to do that for us, to give us the funding for that. I feel that there should be a, uh, and it's getting better, I think, there should be a better, uh, better balance between the two, between the public sector and the private sector. Like I said, I may get into trouble for this, but so be it. <laughs> Put me in jail. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay. So the next question is actually about your personal impressions about Japan, uh, modern day Japan. Do you have any thoughts about Japanese society and culture and as it relates to you? Yeah, <clears throat> that's also a good question. Um, Guam and Japan have national and international challenges that are similar, I think. Uh, what happens in Asia affects both of us. It affects China, for instance. It affects Japan, of course, but also us. <clears throat> um, also, we both have, starting to have anyways, I think Japan already has, but for Guam it's starting to have uh, overcrowding and environmental issues. We got to remember that both Japan and Guam are islands, albeit Japan is a much bigger island, but nonetheless it is an island just like Guam. So we have so to speak, limited in size and very little resources to satisfy, quote, the islands. I, uh, I have not been to Japan in a while, because, uh, but unfortunately, and I, and I want to go back and renew my bonds with my relatives. I have second cousins there, and of course, my, my children have third cousins there. We want to rebond. The problem there is that <coughs> uh, you only have limited time for travel. And the wife and I, where do we want to go when we have time to travel? To see our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren who are not living here. We go to the United States. So that leaves the opportunity to travel to Japan. Skoshi, not, not much, but I do want to go back. But like I said, Japan and Guam, we share very many problems and issues together. We have the same. Okay, great, great thoughts. All right. Um, okay. I, I know that uh, you've had many accomplishments and that you've been recognized as someone who encourages the culture exchange between Guam and Japan. Um, you know, I, uh, so I, I, I'm, you may be very familiar uh, with the, the, JET, uh, the JET program, which provides an opportunity for individuals to study abroad and learn Japanese language and culture. Uh, what are your impressions about something like this? Uh, <clears throat> I am somewhat familiar with the JET program, and not, not that much. Um, I did encourage my, my children to participate in an exchange program, okay. not necessarily to teaching, but in an exchange program uh, in Japan while attending colleges in the US. Two of them did. Yeah. My daughter Tina was an exchange student with Japan, with a Japanese family, uh, while she was attending University of uh, San Francisco. And my oldest son, Frank, 
uh, intentionally stayed with a Japanese family during college and even afterwards. And he picked up the uh, little bit of the language, uh, a lot of the culture and tradition. And I'm glad. That's great. I'm glad that there's that continued curiosity about the Japanese culture and a continued effort to reach out and yes. kind of touch that. That's great. Um, OK, uh, I guess so this is kind of the closing thoughts. Um, and it's kind of similar to what I'd asked you prior. But uh, is there any advice that you'd like to share with the future generation? And what do you think that the new younger <coughs> generation needs to make their aspirations come to life? Yeah, I mentioned it uh, earlier that it's a challenge to get the next generation um, <clears throat> interested. And uh, uh, my challenge with uh, my children and my grandchildren is tell them to pause, you know, to chotomati, to learn about their grandfather and their great grandfather, their roots, uh, their culture and heritage. And it's a work in progress. <laughs> continue to do so. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you very much. Frank. And as far as advice to future generation, get married. Oh. <laughs> Raise a family. Work hard in doing so. And then later on you can enjoy the family. Why not? All right. Um, so, Frank, I, I know that you've actually made quite the impact um, on the Japanese American community on Guam. Um, you are the chairman of the Guam Nikkei Association. Um, and in 2015, you had a unveiling of the Ise Monument that you and the Guam Nikkei Association had worked pretty hard for. In 2018, you were the first Chamorro to be commended for the, promotional, for the promotion of mutual understanding between Japan and the USA. And in 2021, most recently, you were awarded the second Imperial Autumn Decoration of Japan. Um, so of the many accomplishments uh, that you have completed, uh, what was the proudest achievement? Uh, yeah, I can name two, Okay. not just one. Oh, perfect. Uh, one of the most memorable uh, Things I, I I can I can say um, I'm really happy to uh, be a part of is the Issei Memorial Monument in Zigo. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's beautiful. It stands out, and uh, we, we we can talk about that later. The second one uh, is my family. I uh, my wife Meming. Uh, in, in uh, about another week, week and a half, we will be celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary, 6-0. Uh, she, my, uh, my five children, my sons Frank Jr., Jim, uh, John, Tom, and my daughter Tina, and their spouses, um, you throw in their 15 grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren, that to me is probably my proudest achievement. <laughs> um, all right. So with regards to uh, the Issei Monument and the Guam Nikkei Association, uh, what motivated you to go for this goal, to, to make that connection and to build that? Uh, <clears throat> you know, in the beginning, I did not realize that there were as many as 53 Issei's. That's a lot. Uh, that came to Guam from Japan, started families, and uh, I, I thought that there's only perhaps six or so Issei's that came from Japan to Guam, but 53 is a lot. So that kind of motivated me that, hey, let's do a monument you know, recognizing these 53. That was a good motivation. But the other motivation is that when we, when Peter and Odera started doing uh, the research 
He's a professor at the University of Guam. He started doing the research. Um, wow, these Japanese Isseis, they, <clears throat> they raise families, and in turn, those families raise other families that became prominent in Guam. Um, <clears throat> they were prominent Isseis generation in politics. Uh, to name a few, uh, former Senator and Speaker Tami Tanaka, mm -hmm. uh, former Senator Frank Isizaki, uh, old time and very popular senators in the 50s and the 60s before you were born, mm -hmm. <laughs> J.C. Okiyama, and his father's one of the, one of those in the list of 53. Um, there were prominent businessmen. My grandfather, for example. Uh, uh, Jose Onodera is another one. Antonio Sayama is another one. And a very prominent educator, Antonio Yamashita, is a former president of the University of Guam. So when, I, when we started researching this and I learned all of this, there are not six, but 53 essays. I said, wow, let's do it. Let's do it and let's get it done. Uh, I want to kind of go back now um, a little bit into kind of your accomplishments and your career again. I know most recently you received that 2021 uh, Second Imperial Autumn Decoration of Japan. Um, it is a highly recognizable uh, recognition and uh, we were curious to know what were your thoughts and impressions when you first received it? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the award itself is, uh, I never expected it. It was very unexpected. Uh, and in thinking back, it would not be possible without the uh, the uh, support of the Japan, Japan Council General of, in Guam and his staff. Um, the vetting ceremony, the vetting uh, or uh, investigator, investigatory uh, effort that went into it is, is, is pretty enormous. I mean, you, you ask questions through the Council General, Deputy Council General, and uh, his chief of staff, Joe Tino, you ask questions that are very uh, time-consuming, that dates, for me anyways, it dates back 60 years. I don't have the, the documents. Uh, I don't know where the documents are stored anymore. Anyways, uh, it was an unexpected uh, award, and without the support of the Council General Office and the Guam Nikkei Association, don't forget, uh, the its past and present officers, they all contributed to this this award. I mean, I don't know whether I deserve it without those those guys having a hand in the in the in that award. Uh, just to be considered in itself is a is a uh, great honor. But to actually receive it, wow! It's a uh, actually receive the order of the rising sun. It's a uh, humongous, tremendous uh, recognition, and I'm very humble and grateful. Um, and now that you've had a chance to reflect, have your thoughts or feelings changed about the recognition and what it means to you? Well. Like I said, the, uh, the award means a lot to me and the family. And very, very honored and uh, grateful. Japan Cultural Exploration in Guam.